Okay, so welcome everyone. We're very happy to have Professor Dimitri Partner Kozlov from University of Bremen, Germany, and Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology in Japan, who's going to tell us about applied and combinatorial topology. Dimitri, please. Okay, well, thank you for the invitation and uh, thank you for coming to this combined uh, talk and uh, dinner or lunch, I don't know. Yeah. Anyhow, so. Um, So um, my area of research is what we call applied topology, and uh, it's a quite broad area, which includes different things. And um, in this talk, I wanted to speak about uh, some uh, specific aspects of it. So uh, um, first, um, so my plan was that I will first uh, say a few general words and uh, general um, <laughs> techniques um, from this area. And then I will speak about some uh, specific applications. One I uh, thought about graph colorings um, in combinatorics. And one, if I have time, I hope also in the uh, complexity estimates in the uh, theoretical computer science in the of computing specifically. Um, we'll see. So uh, so first, what is uh, applied topology? This is the way we think, we think of it. So there is a larger community of people with quite diverse interest from topological data analysis to all sort of uh, combinatorial complexes. And um, so as in usual topology, one studies global features of shapes uh, with applications in other branches of mathematics. So today I'll talk about, for example, one application in, in discrete mathematics more specifically, and but also applications in computation and also in other sciences. So usual, if you are uh, think about topology, one approach is that you already have a shape. So let's take more specific algebraic topology. Let's say you already have some shape which you want to study, maybe some surface, and then you have a, a way of, in a sense, discretizing it by, for example, triangulating, and then trying from this triangulations compute different algebraic invariants, uh, trying to tell you something about the shape. So this is something which is a classical approach to studying geometric spaces. And this is something that we will not do in, in this in our field. Uh, what we do is rather that we start with a problem where there is no geometry associated with it to start with. And then we produce some, maybe at the first look, artificial constructions, which connect it to a much more developed and interesting field of algebraic topology. So more specifically, when you get the word combinatorial algebra topology, we mean something which I'll say in a few words. So it's quite complicated the way the terminology has developed because in the beginning, like 100 years ago, something like that, uh, before it was algebraic topology, it was called combinatorial topology, where people were thinking that they could just start triangulating and understand everything. And uh, it turned out it was too hard. Certain questions are too hard to understand, like, the difference between collapsing and uh, homotopy equivalence was too far, but yet to quite complicated theory of, for example, torsion, such as white torsion, and so on. So people kind of abandoned combinatorics as too hard to work with and uh, stuck result algebra, which was much nicer for computation. But now, because of this um, uh, application specifically, the combinatorial approach is um, again quite useful. So uh, what I'll talk about will be some sort of combinatorial cell complexes, not necessarily simplicial complexes. And also uh, the way you study them is you use combinatorial tools, which are then a build up on top of the usual tools from algebraic topology, such as spectral sequences or whatever. So when we, when we talk about combinatorial cell complexes, so usually the, you can talk about the um, cell attachments being simple, so anything simplicial, simplicial sets, and all these things, usually uh, it, it means that the cells will be attached in a locally simple way, as opposed to CW complexes, where they will be attached by continuous maps, which can be very complicated. Here, you just specify by combinatorial data how they're attached, but that's not what we mean. That's what, what I would call locally combinatorial. That's not, uh, that certainly is present in, in our field, but it's not the defining feature. Uh, what's more interesting is that they're also globally the cells are imaged by combinatorial objects. So I will give you certain uh, families of such indexing uh, objects. It could be graphs, partitions, permutations, or some other combinatorial 
something in phrase in the combinatorial language. And not only can you can index all the cells in the space by some combinatorial names, but also the operation of taking boundary is given by some combinatorial rules working on the surface, which can be removing vertices or merging some labels or something like that. In such a setting, we usually have uh, very explicitly defined families of complexes which grow very, very fast. So it's only for small values of, as uh, so usually for some parameters, but already for small values of parameters, it's quite hopeless to make any computations uh, um, by, by integrating programs. You can only do it for small values. And for many situations, it's insufficient because interesting things only have, start to happen quite late in the lectures. But there are other combinatorial means such as matchings, orderings, labelings, and so on, which help us to work with the complexes. So um, I have too many slides. I'll be going through some slides just uh, without, I'll just browse through them, so don't worry about it. So, um, so examples of combinatorial. So I'll talk for now about simplicial complexes. I will not only talk about all the time simplicial, but now simplicial. So, uh, one such example would be if you're given an arbitrary graph G. Um, um, this probably is the simplest example I know. Um, you can construct what's called the independence complex of the graph. So that's a simplicial complex. The vertices of this independence complex are just uh, the vertices of the graph G. And uh, as sequences are all possible independent sets. So independent set in the graph means that uh, there are no edges connecting the vertices within this set. So certainly if I have an independent set that any, any subset of it is also independent, so it's a simplicial abstract, called abstract simplicial complex. And so when you graph you have that. So for example, if you and it could be quite interesting. So for example, if you have just a pass of n vertices, then you can prove that uh, the topology of the space you get will be uh, a periodic with period three, um, will be either sphere or contractible space. And uh, with some periods. So very quickly, you will get uh, quite hard open problems. So, for example, in this field, I will not talk about it, but just as I mentioned, one open problem here: um, if uh, you continue this uh, instead of the path, you take a, a grid. So let's take a, um, a two-dimensional grid, n by n, n by n graph, just a grid graph. And the question is, what is the topology of this independent one? So that's actually not a problem. There's a conjecture that it's uh, always homotopy put into edges spheres, but it's only been proven for up to n equal to six, I think. In general, that's open question. So what is the topology of the independence complex of an n by n two dimension? So things like that. So you can uh, you can use that or a little bit more sophisticated maybe. Another source of combinatorial complexes would be provided by so called monotone graph properties. So, if I have a number n and I have a graph property, so graph property means that uh, it's a set of graphs which is closed on that isomorphism. So, any isomorphic graphs that's called a graph property. Um, so, um, it's called monotone if, if, if it has a property uh, gamma and you delete some edges, it will still have its property. Being uh, disconnected is a monotone property or uh, being compatible or something. However, <laughs> but being connected is not So if you have a monotone graph property, then you can construct the simplicial complex, and the vertices of the simplicial complex will be all potential edges, so it will be n choose two vertices. And then for every graph from this property, you'll be in a simplex. So, for example, we have a simplicial complex of all these connected graphs. So, this one is actually, but in general, of course, it's very hard if you have just some graph property to know what the topology of this is. And of course, you can imagine the, this entire area of graphs here, so there are a lot of graph properties, and many of them are one of them. So, you get like a very large family of uh, topological spaces, for some of which we know what they are, for some of Okay, so, so uh, 
just to, uh, just another uh, construction is that for any partially ordered set, so we had it now for graph graph properties. Another construction is you have any partially ordered set. In fact, it is more general than any category. But let me now restrict to partially ordered sets because I want to have uh, just abstract simplicial complexes without any degenerations. Some nice spaces. The problems with these things are not that uh, degenerate. The problem is that they are very big and very complicated, not not the lot. Um, and if I have any partially ordered set. I can make such a simplicial complex by just taking the vertices um, of the partial ordered set as vertices, and synthesis will be all total ordered subsets. So uh, it's a special case of uh, another construction, which is called classifying space of a category. Partial ordered set here is a special case of a category. It's unique morphisms between any two objects. If they either no morphism or it's just one. So that, that just this construction leads to also a very large field, which is called fossil topology. There's a lot of people working on that and putting different uh, tools to prove that uh, to, to work with topology of, of process. So I know other people somewhat yeah. it's a very large field. Just as a very simple case, if you take a Boolean lattice, just set of all subsets, then you would just have a just be some division of some place and execution of some. Okay, so this I probably want to round through. Uh, yeah, it's okay, exactly. And then uh, a little bit more general, um, also something which is used a lot in, for example, in geometric group theory, uh, a little more general construction if you for categories, if the categories for the cyclic, if it's only has identity. Okay. If only identity morphisms have inverses, and, and any morphism from an object itself is an identity. So um, basically, it means you can order things almost like in a partial ordered set, but you may have more than one morphism going down. So you won't have to specify the order relation, but actually, you have to specify exactly the composition of the morphisms. But other than that, you can, you know, if it's a dispute, then you can just order them down. And if you have that, you can still define an order complex. The same definition, but it now will not be a, what most people consider an abstract simplicial complex. It will now be something called generalized simplicial complex. We have two vertices with uh, two edges between them. Some people will not consider a simplicial complex because they have two edges. So that's what a, a category theory is what's called the NERF. Exactly. Sorry, I called it some other but yeah, NERF of a category, exactly. Yeah. Which in general would be a simplicial set, but here. It's just a simplicial complex. And, uh, in this case, it's still almost the same. It depends what you call a simplicial complex, basically. Yes. Exactly. That's exactly right. Exactly. So, for example, in uh, geometric group theory, this is, I don't know how to pronounce this, SCWOL squalls. Um, that's, that's a standard, uh, I think it's called a simple category without groups or something like that. That's a standard. That's the same as we call a secret. And then you know it depends. You have to decide which category you work on. And it's, I know that, in, especially in, in, in strict mathematics, some people don't like to go too abstract and things like that. But actually, if you, for example, want to have your category um, closed under, I don't know, taking group actions or something like taking quotients, then you may actually want to go in a broader category. Maybe you will be able to take portion construction more often. Not always, but it will be better. Maybe, maybe better. Okay, exactly. All right, so um, now I want to talk a little bit about the methods. Um, um, and I'll talk about something that was a bit more theory than here. Uh, so, classically, there is, uh, like I said in the beginning, when one wanted to understand everything combinatorially, one thought that one uh, just to replace uh, the, um, what we now call the strong deformation retract, uh, just by something called elementary simplicial collapse. So, if you have a simplicial complex, and then, and if you have a, um, a maximal simplex uh, tau, then um, sometimes if it, if it has like a, a boundary simplex which nobody else has, you can collapse it. So the elementary simplex should collapse, and uh, you can uh, in the space can be called collapsible if you can collapse it to this point. So of course, if it's collapsible, it's also uh, contractible, uh, but not the other way around, as you know. But we do know that, for example, if it's a contractible, if you if it's collapsible, and um, there is an inverse operation for the expansion, uh, there is a sequence of systems leading to 
right? Because uh, there's this whole theory of Whitehead torsion as an obstruction. Um, and um, since uh, Whitehead torsion gives an economic group and it's, uh, it's zero, then it will be an obstruction. But in general, it's quite uh, um, hard to distinguish this. And so one has kind of abandoned it for a while. But uh, now, more recently, uh, let me see. So uh, more recently, there was this um, discrete Morse theory which people used where they kind of go back to these collapses and uh, use them for uh, computing in this combinatorial setting, computing a lot of things. So it's, it's become a very important computational tool. And And the idea of this is that basically this, uh, that if, if you can just remove some top dimensional synthesis and then it will be collapsible after that, then uh, you know what the topology is. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but um, you, and you, want, you want to allow some internal collapses. So it means that inside I collapse it and then I kind of keep track of what's going on. So um, there is a trade-off. So if you start collapsing things inside and your gluing maps will start to become more complicated and you have to keep track of that. You will become very quickly convoluted if you don't do it right. But the basic premise of this theory is the following definition. So assume we have a simplicial complex K and we have a partial matching on the set of synthesis. So that when you match the synthesis mm -hmm. and uh, one contains the other on the boundary and the difference in dimension is one. So then uh, the matching is called the cyclic if uh, there doesn't exist a cycle where you, 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 go, you, you can go up by matching and then go down. So you don't, you're not allowed to have a cycle like that. It's called a cyclic matching on a set of synthesis. So then there is a theorem for this. For example, one thing says that if you have an absolute simplicial complex and a K prime is simplicial subcomplex, then actually the following statements are equivalent. There exists a sequence of elementary collapses going from K to K prime, even only if the existence of the matching in this extra uh, synthesis. That's, that would be if you don't, if you just do it on top. And in more general, theorem will say if you also do a collapses inside, it will say that if you have a simplicial complex and M is some set of synthesis of K and you have in a secret matching, then there exists a CW complex X, which will have uh, the same number of G cells as the number of unmatched. Uh, Cells, I mentioned synthesis, which are called critical synthesis, which is found to be equivalent to the original complex. So that uh, is, uh, from the theoretical point of view, not a very difficult, in my opinion, not a very difficult result uh, to prove. From a computational point of view, it's an extremely useful result uh, because uh, the way these things work is that you, I'll show you, you, you have like this families of uh, complexes, and you can really use this as a computational tool by substantially reduce. If you if you okay, so your complex will be given by some combinatorial view of those cells, and if you invent a clever matching on the set of uh, synthesis, which will leave very few critical ones, you may be able to understand how they go together, and so you may be able to do the computation by just combinatorial cleverness, understanding this much. So that has been a lot of I don't know hundreds of papers, hundreds and hundreds, which uh, use the discrete Morse theory. To compute something, and uh, it's used also for uh, computation step, for example, for system homology, which 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 Herbert, uh, this kind of for example, works with uh, to reduce the sizes of the data and so on. So that's became a quite important um, tool. And uh, from the theoretical point of view, though, uh, you can also view it this way, which I find personally quite a good way to understand this thing, because I always it was a bit difficult for me to wrap my Mind around these you know, conditions of simple matchings. And uh, one way to see it is the following. So if I have two arbitrary partial sets P and Q, um, and I have a POSIT map, so a POSIT map is the same as the POSIT map. So it comes in. Yeah, exactly. But for POSIT, it's called POSIT map. So there's a category of POSIT for POSIT maps. So then uh, I would call this POSIT map as form fibers if for any Q element in Q, and, and, and it's pretty much well, it would be empty, of course, but if it's not, then it's either a single element or exactly two comparable elements, which is a special family of maps. But allow only these two maps. This is, this is kind of maps. 
uh, then there will be a partial matching, right? Because it, it will be exactly uh, if, if there uh, will be three images. So if there is some cube in which there are two, I will match. And then it turns out that this is actually equivalent. So such a matching will be an acyclic matching always. And the other way around. If I have an acyclic matching, it is given by such a map. So if you want to understand discrete more theory, kind of more conceptually, then it's actually the same as the theory of simply posted maps with small fibers. But the same uh, kind of construction, <laughs> which is, uh, I, know, I like it. It's a kind of very compact way to say so, so theory. Because you just, uh, Basically, you just specify what kind of images of elements you allow, and you get the whole discrete more theory. And in principle, you could specify other primates, the families of images, and get a different. different. Right. So, like I said, this has uh, come out as a good series. Uh, series. So, for any post maps with small fibers, the partial magic of a cyclic, and the other way around. And the cyclic. Right, so this is, um, I don't know, it's, I don't want to, it's a big uh, kind of, there are several books, uh, and so I also published a book about this, so uh, called Agonized Collapse, because it collapsed in organized ways. I, it was, it, it came out as a joke, the title, because I was talking about this to the editor um, of this um, general uh, JSM series of American Mass Society, uh, Yale Fund, and um, he said, well, what the kind of titles are going about organized collapse? And that was just a joke. And he said, Yeah, it's a good title. Maybe somebody will buy it by mistake because they think it's about politics. And <laughs> we'll sell many more, <laughs> many more copies. Many more copies. <laughs> so, this is basically apparently this title is just to confuse people into buying it and then regret it. Anyway, so. Uh, all right, so let me move to applications in discrete mathematics. I think I'm fine, all right. So, yeah, so the application I want to talk about is um, the application to graph colors. So graph colors, of course, are very kind of um, classical um, problem uh, in, um, in combinatorics and computation. And, uh, well, I have to do some applications. So, uh, if you have, um, for example, you can have um, assignment of radio frequencies to some radio stations. And uh, let's say that each radio station has some uh, area to which it wants to send uh, its uh, program. And you want to assign, so each radio frequency is extremely expensive. You only have so many to assign, right? So maybe, maybe many fewer than you have stations in general, but if you don't overlap, you can have the same thing. So then uh, the question is how many, so let's say I have this feature or something else, how many, Frequencies do I need the minimum number of frequencies I need so that they don't uh, so if to overlap they don't use this name. So of course that's the same question mathematically as uh, uh, that we have a graph with vertices and then we connect them by an edge if they overlap and that's a question also called vertex coloring. What is the minimum number of colors you need to color the vertices? It's called chromatic number of a graph. It was one of the first. Uh, problems computing chromatic number of the graph was one of the first problems in the 70s, uh, which was proved to be only complete. It's really hard for it. So, deciding the chromatic number is two is, is, is simple, but deciding whether it is three is less. So, that's a very elementary question, it occurs everywhere, and it's extremely hard to uh, provide um, to compute the chromatic number. And also to bound it. So, of course, as what's hard is, uh, as usual in complexity is the lower bounds, right? Because the upper bound you can produce by, if you're likely to just color it in some number of colors, and then you say, oops, I did it with uh, seven colors. So it's at most seven. But, uh, you know, if I want to, to explain to you why it cannot be six, um, how do I do this? I have to, yeah. So I have to find some, I mean, of course, if it contains like a com very large complete graph, it's simple because I say, look, I have a very large complete subgraph in my graph, I will need the same. But usually these obstructions are uh, global, right? So even for having an odd number of colors, the obstructions are odd cycles. But you see that your cycle is odd, you have to basically go through the entire cycle. And somewhere you have like a very, very, very long odd cycle. And for, uh, and that's for two, for two is actually easy. And for higher numbers, uh, that's very hard. Right. So here's another example of the graph. This one actually needs four colors. And uh, this is called the chromatic number of this graph. Okay. 
And so what we want to talk about, or what I want to talk about today is the following idea. So this is not bad, this is a feature of the Ansatz with the German work, which made it international approach. Um, so the idea is, uh, like I was saying in the beginning, bring the topology in where it's not existing in the beginning. So I start with a graph and I want to color it. That's all I want to do. And then I construct a topological space, which it will be a little bit more complicated construction depending on one graph, but actually on two graphs, but some topological space. Let's say I fix that. And, um, and then studying topological properties of this space and then from these properties, deriving something about the combinatorial properties of G, uh, which is the uh, bounds for the chromatic Right. So usually this area is uh, simple, this is kind of okay, but this one's going to be hard. So it's usually it ends up like this. So people translate something and then they just study it in this area and never go back because it's actually very hard to derive something for the original question. So they just forget about it. I mean, study it because it's interesting. Isn't it? That's the standard <laughs> procedure. Okay, so let me uh, talk about, uh, so one thing maybe I can explain is the construction itself. So let's say I have uh, two graphs. So first of all, there is a classical notion of graph homomorphism, generalizing that of coloring. So a graph homomorphism between two graphs is just a map between vertices, which maps edges to edges. So let's say I'm talking about uh, graphs without loops, just the simple graphs. So then obviously it's not the same as a simple show uh, map between, because it's rigid. Right? So I'm not allowed to the same vertices. So for example, if I want to study that graph homomorphisms from a triangle to an edge, then it will be very fast because there are no maps at all. There are no graph homomorphisms at all. So a graph homomorphism generalize the graph colorings because the uh, graph is uncolorable, obviously, if only we have a map from G to the so-called complete graph. This graph is what the graph series for some strange reason all complete. It means if you have n vertices and all the edges between vertices. Uh, without loops, so you know, uh, to be completely with loops. That's what's called complete. If it was with loops, it would be easy to map. So that uh, so, so the best way to think about this, in my opinion, is to think about this as a category. So you have a category of graphs, and you have graph or more things and more. So you can compose them, and it will give you again a graph homomorphism, composition of two graph homomorphisms. And then if you think about it this way, then the question of graph coloring just becomes a question like in your category, you have some selected uh, special object which has a complete graph, which you can map to each other. And then you're trying to find morphisms into this chain. And then your question is how, where, where can you map it to? Once you map it to something, you also have to cut it. So once you start to think about this way, it, uh, so this question is quite very, very hard and also computation again with graph colorings. And one reason is because it's very hard to do any kind of theory. So, so of course there are some elementary things you can do and okay, but then they're very quickly done. And then, uh, so one uh, approach would be to connect it to some category where there is more abstraction theory between maps. So what, and in this, uh, what I would talk about is we connected to a category with uh, spaces with a free Z2 action. Okay, because in this in this category, there are abstractions in terms of Stiefel Witten characteristic classes and vanishing of powers of Stiefel Witten characteristic classes. And it's, it sounds like a more complicated, but actually it's much simpler because the theory is much more developed and we can actually use it for proof examples. So, uh, Given two graphs. So for now, let me just stick with one graph T and the complete graph. I construct a, a space, which is unfortunately not a simplicial complex, but close, uh, whose um, that's going to be topological space. It will be cells, and cells are almost as as they are direct products of synthesis. They can subdivide it, but it wouldn't be very natural. So it's the it's structure of cells as good as it is. So direct products of synthesis. And uh, what well, is if, this, if this, so it's, you can do it for you too, but let's say the second one is a complete graph. So then is this direct product of synthesis will be just assignments of colors to vertices of T such that an arbitrary choice of one color per list will yield an admissible color of T. 
So in particular, of course, if it's, uh, if it's not colored, it will be empty. <laughs> but let's say we have n large enough, then there will be many colors. And so there will be. So in more general, we can replace uh, this is a general number of graph G and construct a space on TG as a vertice. So the vertices of this space will be all graph homomorphisms. So I have two graphs and the, and the vertex is any graph homomorphism. So an edge, I connect two graph homomorphisms by an edge. Um, if I can, if I can just change, if I have a graph homomorphism, I just change it in one vertex to another one, then it's uh, an edge. Just one. Okay, so that's also a, a classical object called graph of graph homomorphisms. This way you can walk between the graph homomorphisms. But in this construction, you also attach higher dimensional cells. For example, if I have uh, three um, uh, graph homomorphisms and they all differ from each other in the same vertex, and I can just change it, then I will put in a triangle. That will be one uh, two dimensional. Cell, but there will be also other type of two dimensional cells. Namely, I can have four in, in graph homomorphisms. I have two locations, and I can and I have an option of choosing here color A to B and here C to D. And I can do any one, and it, they all get it colorings. Let's say they're far from each other. So the flexibility in my coloring. So that would be for me a cell uh, would be a direct product of two uh, intervals. So these are two dimensional cells, either triangles or direct products. And then uh, you can do it for any dimensions so or finite cells. So if you have several locations where you can change the colors, you will have a, so you will get something like that as a space. And that would be a space of all three colors of, uh, of this row. Excuse me. Yeah. Before you go, um, so the the graph of homomorphisms you can get by noticing that you have this co-graph with the point including into the edge. And then multiplying by that and taking the sets of homomorphisms out. So that you know, if this is not, if, if I just said this makes sense, then my question is that one. So is it a question? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, is there a similar description of this cell complex where you can get it from sort of functorially? You have your shapes and then you multiply by them and map out, and that gives you a dual thing shape that gives you your cell complex. Or I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what it is, but I, I can tell you that you can read all this higher cell structure just from the graph of graph homomorphisms. Yes. Oh, okay. So, actually, a shorter way to say it, but you would have to prove this one, would be that I take a graph of graph homomorphism, and then I take all possible cells. But the condition on the cells, they would be, have to be direct products of simplices. So, there is a related construction called flag complex. Where you have a graph and then you put in all the simplices if the complete cell graph is in there. Oh, okay. And this one is the same, but for products of simplices. Oh, okay. Okay, thanks. I think yeah, that, okay. Uh, right. And and the same, and also if this whole thing sits inside. So just like any simplicial complex will sit inside a simplex, you just carve it out which ones you take. This one will sit in a direct product of simplices. You just carve out which ones you take. Yeah. Thank you. But it will be uh, just like a usual simplicial complex, which can be arbitrarily hard because, yeah. But the point is, actually, it's um, it's nice uh, because you can um, explain it to, to the kids some kind of, and also it, it produces beautiful pictures. And uh, I was thinking why it produces beautiful pictures, and I realized why. Because the only examples I can actually do by hand are rather small, and small graphs have a lot of symmetries. It's actually you have to construct a big graph until it has little symmetries, and uh, the uh, the symmetry group of both graphs will. Uh, it will act. Oops, uh, will act on the space, and so it will have a lot of symmetries because both uh, both groups act on it. So that's why it looks beautiful. But it's because we only look at small. Yeah, just for kind of uh, showing more examples, if I take a six cycle and look at all three columns of a six cycle, I will get a more interesting picture, which will be um, a complex uh, con consisting of uh, seven. Uh, Connected components, six of them will be just isolated vertices. This would be the rigid covering. So I have covering one, two, three, one, two, three, and I'm basically it's rigid. I cannot move any, I cannot change any color to any other color. So that's isolated vertex. So any kind of rigid covering will be just an always just an isolated vertex. And then there will be this other component where I can change things quite a lot.
I, I think you'll hold it. So it's like a six cubes connected by n vertices, and then at each point there are three um, uh, squares, so they, which are which, it, a lot of it looks like this, and, and, and at each joint. So you, you will have a lot of topology very quickly to study, and uh, it's in general not known most of the time what the topology is of the spaces. Just very few cases. <coughs> so. Okay. So, um, but one thing which, which which one can prove about them is that um, actually uh, the question of Lobas um, is the following. So, um, the idea um, of this um, of his conjecture and in this general approach, which we call approach test graphs, test graphs, is um, that. Uh, we want to study graph colorings, which means mapping our graphs to complete graphs. Okay. Now it's very hard question. Very hard question. We don't, otherwise, we wouldn't need it. So instead of trying to map our graphs into complete graphs, let's just map some other graphs, small graphs, like an edge maybe or a node cycle, into our graphs. Okay. So we will have a lot of things to study. And then, just like it's usual in topology, we will compose. So if I have a test graph, let's say a node cycle. And I know something about the space of maps from the salt cycle into my graph. Then I can actually prove that the chromatic number um, has a, a lower bound because if um, because if I had a graph color, I, I could compose them. You can compose these things, and then uh, I would be able to see something about the space of how what cycle complete graphs, which is actually quite complicated space, but uh, you can look at abstractions there. So is this, I mean, I'm simplifying it a little bit because you need to actually do some computations, quite a lot of computations, but the general idea is this. And so you can use, uh, you can prove statements like this, which will say that uh, if such a space is K-connected and if you have a specific graph G, you can actually compute the space. Yeah, because it's more then, you, then you get a lower bound for the current. So the same bound also is true for, uh, there is some single bound for the edge, this was before this conjecture, but that was a simple bound. That was a bit more complicated. So, uh, so, 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 actually, um, from the computational, I have to say one thing uh, that from the computational point of view, this theorem uh, or this conjecture, actually, this conjecture seems like a nonsense because it's very hard computationally to find a lower bound for the chromatic number. But it's also extremely hard computationally to show that the space is state connected. So, <laughs> From a theoretical point, it's very interesting, right? The space is connected. But from a computational point of view, you just replace one very hard computational point with another very hard computational point. But fortunately, uh, the way we settled this conjecture back then, like long time ago, actually, um, was that um, we find abstractions in this characteristic classes, which are just cohomology classes, which are actually very easy to compute because basically it's just linear algebra. You just need the powers of them. Uh, so that's that's uh, that was much better. So you actually from a point of view of computation, it's a very good thing because you replace something which is very hard with something which is computation. Now, it will not uh, give you the, the chromatic number. It will only give you the lower bound. And just we were just talking about the other night, uh, Sadok and I was saying that I have a meta theorem that uh, any, so, so any kind of approximation from the topological side we can do to chromatic numbers will, will always, the chromatic number will always escape. I'll always find an example which is even more complicated. So it's like, you know, unless you find topological space up to homeomorphism. No matter what clever invariant you find, there will always one. So, um, but that's the lower bound. Before you go on, sorry, is that yeah. for any R or for all yeah. R? If, if for some R, it is K connected, it will give you the bound. Thank you. Because, um, yeah, because it's um, so when R grows, it will be easier to map things in. So, so say let's, let's say R is one, and if you're just looking at a triangle, so and it's very likely you're not able to map it in the tool because uh, there is no triangle. But if it's a long object, then you can map. But the point is, of course, yeah. If you if you if you if you can just map it in, if it's not empty, yeah, then you will know that the chromatic number is three. And that theorem says that like we can map it; it's not empty. Okay, but then also the set of maps is connected. Then it's one up. It's it's simply connected. Then it's one up, and then it's two connected, and so on. 
And in fact, this actual statement is a little bit stronger, saying that if the certain powers of uh, characteristic classes are zero, we get the implication for any operator. Right. So, uh, okay. So that's that's the graph now, I think. And uh, yeah, like I say, that's uh, that also has led to a whole very very many, many papers studying the spaces and uh, the very interesting uh, topological spaces coming out of special cases. So, uh, just to give you an example of uh, um, an open question, because I like to have some open questions. In terms of so here is, for example, a long-standing open question, which actually originally comes from complexity theory in, in computer science, but now it's about graph properties and some tissue complexes. Right. And that, uh, uh, that's a question, this is so-called the basis of this conjecture. So if you have a simplicial complex K, um, it's called non evasive uh, There is a recursive definition. So either this uh, is a simple <coughs> vertex, a single word, or inductively, there is a vertex V, so that if I delete it, it's non evasive, and the link of it is non evasive. So if you want, you can generate all non evasive complexes starting from a single vertex and then adding things uh, to it over non evasive sub complexes, links generated. Uh, I think now this is a general definition. Originally, it was just for some graph properties, which you want to use. And so the conjecture says that if you have such a uh, space and non and its automorphism group acts transitively on its vertex, so then it's a simplex. So that, that, that for example, is only proven for uh, uh, prime powers when the number of vertices of prime power and for small cases. And I have to say that. Certainly but I think I'll take it. Anyway, so that's that's an only reason for So some people will have this. That will be an example where you don't know what to do. I mean, at least I don't know where something. Okay. Um, so anyway, so that's just uh, something which uh, even longer ago, so uh, writing in this book, uh, I found direct topology and um, Anyhow, so that was this thing. Okay, so in the, we allow me the last 15 minutes. I think that's correct. Um, I want to talk a little bit, uh, go even, so this is applications within mathematics still. But now I want to go outside of mathematics and uh, go to applications in distributed computing. So that's, um, that, that's actually for, for me at least was quite comfortable. And I was at some conference um, where so some people from distributed computing and uh, I was doing these other things. And, and then uh, they, they talked to me and they said uh, they, they can translate some things into distributional complexes, but they don't know how to proceed. They don't know. And that, that's because they saw that's because they don't know mathematics, so they are somehow not clever enough. Turned out that they were clever enough, it was very hard questions. <laughs> doesn't help. But, um, Anyhow, so it's uh, actually quite was quite fascinating to me, and it took me actually some time to, to learn the things in distributed computing because I was uh, educated as, as a mathematician. And it's actually quite difficult to understand the same thing. But um, now I kind of understand how we're doing. It's actually quite fascinating connection, which also leads to uh, very interesting open problems, which can be formulated purely in that. Uh, so, uh, ah, let's look at so just as a general setting, it's, uh, well, it's very general. So uh, let's say you have, and so, so it's, not, it's not what people call parallel computing, it's something else. So here it's more about communication and it's more like exchanging information between the nodes. So you have end processes which want to perform a certain task, which most likely would be just agreeing on something. Maybe they have values zero and one and they want to send each other information and they agree on something. There is some choice of model of communication, which are different models, which one standard model, which would be peer-to-peer -peer network, where they have a network and they just send messages to each other. And there are some different set of conditions and will the messages arrive, may they be corrupted and so on. And this choice of possible failures and also choice of timing models. Do we know how long it takes? And maybe it's 
what's usually interesting to study so called asynchronous communication model where we don't know how long does it just take. Uh, we just have some conditions like if we send one message and then the other one, if they arrive in the same order, then they change. That's really all. So that, that leads to quite difficult questions where you have to decide under uncertainty because if you just don't hear from some node, you don't know if it's um, as a message is, or is late or is in both is dead or something like this. So, of course, anybody who is an editor of a journal knows about this when you send somebody to read. And at some point, you have to make the hard decision is, is the node dead or is it just slow? Uh, So, um, and then the usual goals, like in any complexity setting, you have possibility results, if it's possible, you have complexity estimates, and finally, the last step, design of efficient protocols. So in this um, area, people don't talk about algorithms, they talk about protocols, but it's really the same thing. It's only in the usual output, like in, in a sequential computation, you have one processor and two does computation and produces what's called algorithm. And here you have a network of things and they run and then it's called it's really the same thing and the, the different settings. Most of the time we want them to have identical protocols, uh, which may only use something like only their ID number and things like that. Anyway. So uh, so just as an example, just to give you a taste of what these kind of things are. So the processes, um, so let's say we have processes that use shared memory to coordinate among themselves. And they need to coordinate assignment of unique communication channels. Okay. So, um, so let's say, okay, so here is this. One. So, uh, we can do it with the airport or uh, with the assignment of, uh, of the channels. So, okay, maybe the airport is a, is a good uh, analogy. So, let's say you have an airport and then you have landing strips. Okay. The number of landing strips is, I don't know, not that many. I don't even in Dubai, maybe like five landing, I don't know. Some number, not, not big number. Okay. Now, and then you have potentially flights which come in, which is, of course, by order of magnitude larger than the number of landing streets. And then uh, you have uh, they, they're coming in and they're communicating in this certain communication model, which I would have to describe. So, but anyway, and um, you have a restriction on how many can come in at the same time. And then the question is how many uh, communication channels do you need to? Minimum number which we would be able to do this. So, uh, okay, so the model is a different model. So, of course, if everybody knows everything at any time, then it's very easy because if you have like a need on present AT or something, then it will just say, okay, three planes are coming in, they'll get the three, three planes. But that's not how it works. So, you have a communication and the way let's say in this model it works is that they're coming in and then as a, he just sends his uh, I don't know, flight number or something like that and then he can look uh, at, at the let's say there is let's say there is no central this is distributed so there is no central authority there is just a central register where you have two operations each uh, processor can read what's in it and can write what he has and then there are different uh, possibilities, even if two of them. Um, for example, if I, uh, you know, if I write to it and then I read it and I don't see anybody, it can be that somebody was in between. Uh, that you know, this operations can intertwine in different ways, and you have to de design a protocol which will work in this situation. So, for example, here for two processes, you need three, you need three and here is a protocol. Maybe um, I think what I'm going to do is that I, I want to uh, go to. Um, so there are many, 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 many tasks in this distributed computing, and I want to connect it to the simplicial setting because I think that's what we understand uh, better, and uh, and maybe formulate some open question in terms of that. So for this, I, I have to look for a picture uh, which I have here. Okay, all right. Let me explain to you first of all what is this picture and then how it is related to distributed computing and then what kind of open questions we have. So, so let's start just as a triangle. So uh, I want to subdivide it. So we all know from the algebraic topology a standard so-called very static subdivision. Okay, so it would look different, right? This would be like this. 
I put a somebody center in every simplex and I connect. Now, uh, let's think uh, that, uh, okay, maybe I'll just do it here. So let's say, so I have a recent situation. There is a combinatorial way to do it, but I will just do it generally. So, so let me now take each very center and push it a little bit to the sides. So I push this one, this one. And this, so each time I push away from the you know, vertices which generate. So each very center has a set of vertices which are associated to the very center of. And I push away. So this one, I push this way. This way, this way. Then I have new vertices. And then I have a new situation. So I missed the picture. Okay, so I have the uh, then I push this. Uh, and then I raise the base into it. So uh, that would be this much. So this uh, country, this subdivision, so you can do it in any um, simplex. It's also uh, has the same properties as the eccentric one that it does to the lower dimensional simplex, the same as the uh, initial. Right, so on the lower one, it happens. So it, it means that you can iterate it. That's what it means. It means that I can only not subdivide, not just the simplex, but any simplicial complex, I can subdivide like that. And therefore, I have iterated what we call standard chromatic subdivision. So that uh, appears on the same time. It's called in the work of Tom and in um, and, 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 and so on. We call it standard chromatic subdivision because, unlike the very same subdivision, it behaves very nicely with respect to colors. So, if I had three colors before, if I do a very one, it means I put the very in the middle, I need an additional color. So, I use that when you need to rate the very subdivision, so which means that the number of colors will explode. And here, I can just do the same number. And it's uh, in a sense, in the So this picture has to do with uh, communication protocols between three processes if we do one round of communication where they read and write in the common memory. So uh, let's, uh, so the colors are the type of process. So let's, let's, let's take the blue one. So let's say um, each one just writes his information and reads it once a whole thing. So what can happen, for example, with the blue process? So he can, um, what he will read can the four different things he can see. Maybe he sees nobody else, maybe he sees one of the guys, or four options, and maybe he sees both of them. So there are four options. These are the four vertices in here. And the same uh, as the vertices for the other three guys. So for each uh, processor uh, for, uh, in this uh, communication, the vertices correspond to their role view after performing their protocol. So they perform it and then there is a way. And the triangles, so put the triangles, correspond to all possible performance, uh, all possible uh, uh, performance of the product. So, for example, what can happen? Like one option would be the all right and the all read and they all see each other. That would be the middle triangle where they all see each other. Or it could be like uh, this one would be that this guy only sees himself because he was first and he's done, and the other two guys see everybody else. And this would be more complicated where they read like one and then two and three. So the first guy sees nobody, the second guy sees him, and the first guy and the third guy sees everybody. Because there are actually, if you think about it, 13 possibilities in this model. In general, you can count them, it's called weighted bell number, a very, very quickly growing number of all possibilities. And the idea in the applications of the situation methods for student computing is to produce a geometric space, a situational complex, where the vertices are all possible views of the uh, of the of the of so the vertices are all possible views of the single um, agents of what has happened and the top dimensional synthesis. Of all possibilities which in which you know the, the thing has run. So this would be if, it, if you run it one round, you will have it this way. If you run two rounds, you will have an iterated basic subdivision. So uh, sorry, uh, iterated standard chromatic subdivision, I have to continue. So 
divided it. So, so have a simplicial picture like that. And I can, uh, so let me just formulate the mathematical question and I can maybe, if I have time, I'll say how this is related to this computer or just. Uh, so the mathematical question is now the following. So if I have a simplex, let's say with, uh, you know, uh, and so, so I call it like this is n plus one vertices. And I have an iterated subdivision. So I have IG. So it turns out the following question is important. So the question is does there exist, does there exist a zero one labeling? Vertices. So, so I want to assign like zeros and ones vertices subject to the following conditions. Conditions. And there are two conditions. And the first condition is that in each top dimensional simplex has mixed labels. So no two-dimensional simplex uh, has only zero or n. So obviously it's not going to be like uh, or anything like that because you only have two zero and one and you have a lot of edges. So, but uh, what we want is, for example, here assign zero one so with no triangle is only zero only one. That's one condition. And the second condition, okay. So for the tri for the triangle, it would be. Uh, two things that all the uh, the labels at the end vertices are the same. So let's say if I put zero here, zero, then it must go to zero here and zero here. And the second condition is that if I know the labels on one edge, then I know them on all edges. Namely, I have an orientation on the edges, which is a standard orientation topologist I used to. So if I call this one one, two, three, I always orient to the smaller to the bigger one, not in a loop. And then there is an identification between the edges. So if I know that this is a label in here, one zero, then it must be the same here. So it might be one zero going this way, and here one zero. For higher dimensional simplex, I would have to have a little bit more complicated condition, but basically the same. Yeah. Should the bottom will be zero. Oh no, sorry, one zero. I think it's zero. Sorry. zero. So for a higher dimensional simplex, um, I would have to have a condition for every dimension of the boundary simplices. But you know, if you look at like simplicial sets, you know this. So if, if you have a bound any two boundary simplices of the same dimension, there'll be a unique linear isomorphism preserving the order of the vertices, and that labeling has to be um, invariant under this. So uh, there are two ways to formulate it. You can formulate it as boundary conditional simplex. Or you could from or you could instead of a simplex take a, a space where you simply already have bloom. Bloom. So I, here I will just glue the three vertices, identify and identify the boundary edges in this direction. For here I will have dance here. And higher simplices I'll have, I don't know, higher dimensional dance. And I could say I just put play with zero and one and that just subject to the first condition. Or I could unfold it and say I put it on simplex subject to that condition and the boundary condition. Either way, there is only one. You will have a once you do them all, you will just have one simplex in each dimension. There is only one space out there because only have one. You know, the boundary space. Only have one image. There is unique. Right. And and so it turns out that that's very important question. So for example, for a so if it exists for some t, it will also exist for the higher t's, which you can mathematically prove. But which is obvious to any computer scientist, it's like this physics already. You have to prove that this is obvious. For computer science, it's obvious because if it's okay, because the formulation is like this if it exists for this n and for this t, it means that a certain protocol, it's called weak symmetry breaking in the language, is solvable in t rounds. And of course, it's obvious that if it's solvable in t rounds, it will also be solvable in t plus one rounds. You simply do nothing in this last round. But in this model, you have to extend it, but you can't. So once you can do it, you can do it for all higher. And we also know for which n you can do it. So there is a theorem which says that uh, such t exists 
if and only if n plus one is a prime polynomial. That is not a prime polynomial. So, yeah. I mean. So uh, this is a very strange business. It's very strange theory because in computation, in theory of computation, it means you're solving some protocol between uh, agents. Okay. The protocol is actually so, so, so the task is actually very simple. The task is just uh, you have your inputs and uh, your, your, your names, and you have to agree to break into two groups so that no, none of the two groups is empty. It's called weak symmetry break. But once you reformulate it here, it turns out that yes, they can break into two groups if and only if their number is not a prime power, which is very strange because it should depend on if the number is or not, but it's actually a system, right? And then also there is, so, so uh, the second thing is that you, one, does, one does not have an explicit way to break them if it is not a prime power. So even for six, I think. Yeah. So, um, and there's no, and so the question is, what is the bound in T? So for N uh, plus one equal, what is the power is, what is the minimum T? So that's a question. Can you remind me, what is the question in distributed computing that we're solving here if from the application point of view? What would we ask? I, I didn't exactly say it, so it's hard to remind, but I can try to say it. Okay. <laughs> right, I didn't, so I didn't tell you. But I can, so in this computational model, which I would have to spend like maybe 20 minutes to explain exactly what is allowed for them to do. But the task is this, you have, in, in this case, n plus one agents, okay? Each one has an ID, okay? All they are allowed to do is when they communicate with each other is to compare their IDs. They're not allowed to use what ID is. So if your ID is 583, you're not allowed to use another 583. All you're allowed to do is when you communicate with ID 794, you know that yours is lower. But if you're not allowed to do that, you can do nothing because it's all symmetric. They have to run the same protocol. Okay. But you can compare. Okay. And, and, the, and, the, and the task is uh, can they then, after in this model, communicate and then break into two groups so that none of the group is empty. Or if you want, can they all fix the value zero and one so that not everybody inside at zero, not everybody inside at one. Right. Okay, so just out of curiosity, what, what in practice, like an actual example of practice, what, where does this problem arise? Okay, so, 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 okay. Okay. so that, that is, I have to say something. Okay. So um, this has to do, originally, it has to do with the uh, processor design. So uh, when you design a processor in a computer, then uh, you have to decide, and they become more and more complex over time. You have to decide what kind of operations do you want to implement on the level of processor and which on the level of software. So you, uh, so you want to minimize the number of women and different operations which you can operate and which you can which you do in the process. But if you do too few, then some tests will not be solved. And that's how this whole theory of theoretical distributed computing has developed. So one started to say, okay, so what kind of things do we need to implement in the processor? And uh, so we need, so they realized they didn't want to do that, but they realized they need to have some sort of formalization, some sort of formal systems. And they need to have results, which will say that, uh, well, actually they don't want to have this result, but they will, uh, that if you only have this set of operations and there are certain tasks you will not be able to solve. And uh, so there are all kinds of operations you can implement, right? So I don't know, set and check or something like that, where your operation would be in atomic step, which means nobody cuts in between. Let's set uh, something to zero, some thing, and then check the other one, something like that. If you, in principle, it's two. And if you just do it, it maybe something happens in between. So this will be called atomic uh, step. And the, if you have all if the results of what this is called critical uh, period, which means in this period when you're doing these things, nothing else will happen. Okay. And so this way it's all developed. So then there is a whole list of such such standard tests. So agreement. So there are all kinds of here, so I didn't go through, but they're all kind of like if you have hundred nodes and they have um, I don't know, 100 values, can they agree after a certain communication on and to be reduced to 99 values? And there are theorems which say in this communication mode they cannot. So they, they will never be able, it's called agreement, they okay, said agreement. And this is one of the steps, it's called mixing if you break in this. So these are, this are, this are uh, test tasks, so there's a test, a test tasks to um, classify 
different computational models. And the computational models are defined by the set of atomic operations you allow to. In this model, this is called the standard model, the atomic operations, are, there are two atomic operations. One is to write my um, information into the register, and the other one is to read the entire register. It's just, that's, I mean, if, if you, if you, you know, it's, in, I think it's like this with many applications, but here also, once you actually decide on conditions, and either there's like a, a choice in any step, like do I allow this? Do I, for example, should I allow that it only reads its own register, or can it read the entire register in a next step? So there, for example, the theorem which would say that it will be equivalent, so it doesn't matter. Once they're equivalent, you kind of assume the maximum. So if, if it if it doesn't cost anything to read the entire register. So in this model, can you solve it or not? And if you can, how many how many rounds do you need? And so that's uh, that's actually quite hard complexity question, which uh, nobody seems to be able to say anything about. So uh, the only I show you maybe as a finishing. Just to tell you strange things going on. Uh, so, for example, uh, in two rounds you cannot solve anything. But it, and and uh, so they, they proved that they can solve it for uh, if it's not a prime power. Because this is all computer scientists do. <coughs> this, uh, this is our theory. Uh, but they don't have a protocol. And and also the bound they have they had was like a double exponential bound. So they can prove it, but it's like not even exponential, but double exponential. It's very, very, very many rounds you need. Uh, and it's of course very slow. So but it turns out that for example for six, the first question is six. Because it's the first number which is not a prime power. And so for six, it turns out you can do it in three rounds, even though nobody has a protocol, but uh, depends on what you mean by protocol. Um, but yeah, that's a matter of discussion, uh, lively discussion. But anyway, and so what one can prove, strangely, it, if there is such a binomial identity for some values, then you can solve in three rounds. So it's some sort of data finding equation. So for six, you have this very strange identity with six is binomial. And because of that fact, this numerical fact, there exists such a code. And um, also, if you uh, do any power, any multiple of six, it also exists. So you can really strange uh, situation. So uh, so what we proved in the first case, so this is a more general, but in the first set, uh, in the first step, we proved that if it's a multiple of six, you can do in three rounds. So that's very strange. That's a very unusual situation from complexity theory because in complexity theory, usually if you can't solve, then the, the, the time you will need to solve it will grow with the number. But here it doesn't seem to grow because it's, you can solve in constant time for infinitely many values, but very special values. And uh, so far, unfortunately, is the only way we can tell this uh, strange uh, uh, identity on the binomial coefficients, which is, I don't know, for some they exist, for some they don't. I don't know, anyway. So, um, yeah, so if you're interested in this stuff, there is this uh, book called uh, the Supernatural Pathology. There's two other courses, but they are both in computer science uh, from our research in Sergio Exxon. And um, anyhow, so it would be nice to make a progress in this neighborly question, but unfortunately, the biggest obstacle so far is that despite of my attempts, I couldn't connect it too much to um, algebraic topology and algebraic invariance. That's a problem because once you connect, it's much easier. So it's become much easier. Here is a problem is it's not just topology, but really spatial structure itself. Which is, uh, which is too hard to do. So the more clever has to do. Anyway, I think I'll stop here. Yeah, I have a question. Sure. So the, the steeple with the glasses, you mentioned them as obstructions to graph coverings in that main result that you have. What are they steeple with the glasses on? Ah, uh, yeah, so uh, they are of the quotient uh, of the home on the test ground the home space. divided by Z2. Oh, divided by Z2. You have a free, so Z2 action will be a free action. Oh, I see. Okay. And, and, but that, it will not be for all test classes, but the what side of the group. Yeah. Because it's always like if you, if you your test graph, there is some edge which is flipped by the action, then the, the action on the corresponding space complex will be free Z2 action. So you mentioned powers, so powers of degree one steeple with classes, or yeah, okay. 
Um, and uh, yeah, another question. So you mentioned that independence complex that uh, path 3K is homotopic to a wedge of spheres, right? Or to, uh, yeah. I yeah, that, I, I don't remember. yeah, okay. Uh, and then that reminds me, there's another simple show object, these Fitz buildings, if I remember correctly, they also are on the one hand simple shell, but also there's a result that there is homotopy equivalent to wedges of spheres. So I know their things are related. Um, indirectly. Uh, so as I think the Fitz buildings are probably equivalent to the wedges of spheres of the top dimension. So in this ones are not, they're not in the top dimension. They're spheres, but not in the top. This whole space has a higher dimension. But these buildings work in, in this uh, garden of examples in the beginning uh, where people used all kinds of methods to show that uh, natural, exact natural complexes uh, are homotopy to the register spheres. But the tools in the beginning, like show ability from that, they were only, one could only use them if your space is, you can only, you can only prove that your space will be homotopy to the register spheres of the top dimension. Right, this more modern tools, they don't have this assumption. I see. Uh, it can be any dimension. It's more general. They're more general. Unfortunately, it's still a major spheres, but uh, yeah, in many spaces, it's not. Yeah, so an example would be uh, this all this home complex is analog, obviously. That's interesting. Any other questions? If I may ask a, a big question, I don't actually know what I'm saying now, but I, I want to ask this. Is something like the Byzantine fault tolerant consensus algorithm something that falls under this the consensus algorithm? Is this something in distributed computing that yes. these methods yes. apply to? Yes, absolutely. Very good. I, you know, I came across this recently looking for something else and I just okay. So <laughs> I I okay, I'll, so tell wondering. I'll tell you something about it. So there was this one slide I don't want to get to that uh, with many different things that you need to fix. Uh, you need to fix like other in the network. With a communicate three point and register, blah, 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 blah. One of the things you need to fix is the type of faults they are allowed to do. Okay. So, the, this whole business I was talking about is the fault means he, uh, the things may fail, which, uh, uh, but that's really good. So, failing means the guy doesn't, you know, doesn't reply. There's no correspondence with this at all. Just, just a, a simple fault. Okay. The Byzantine fault is another choice in this mode. Which we do not do. The Byzantine fault means that his information can become corrupted. So he replies, but wrong information. Okay, so the classical Byzantine fault would be, for example, in the in European Union, uh, the country is sending in their budget uh, things and then agrees so over a number of years, sending in the wrong ones. So you, you hear from the guy and the information is corrupted, but you don't know it. Okay? And that, that's a harder fault to deal with. So there is a whole set, there is a whole area of this computing. How do you deal with Byzantine faults? And you believe it or not, but we can design protocols which will solve tasks despite of the Byzantine faults under the conditions that not too many more attack around. So most of these protocols will be some sort of majority voting. They will communicate and they will basically will be majority voting some kind of. I mean, that's what I told them, but they say, ah, I think that's what you can do. And if not too many are corrupted, the healthy ones will actually help <laughs> both. That's what that's Byzantine for. So there is a Byzantine, I don't know, because of Byzantine, they all speak different languages. And it's, it's terminology. Right. So so is combinatorial topology something that is applicable to that problem? Well, yeah, but I mean uh, it will be much more complicated. So there, 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 there will be much more complicated complexes. Yeah, yeah, this one's uh, the simplest standard situation. Also, even yeah, you don't even need to go to the Byzantine to make more complicated spaces. So um, in this situation, for example, they, they are executing in rounds and they are very orderly. So each, so there is a round and each one, each one does it once and they are coming groups without intertwining. So this is just executions like this. A certain group of processes get activated, do their thing, read write. Then another group of processes get activated, read write. Then they will do it. That's one round. Then the round repeats. That's the most ordinary thing. So you can imagine other things can happen. Like one gun gets activated, sends something. Before he hears anything, the other guy gets activated, that's his thing, so, so he can complicate it first and first. And Byzantine would be, in my opinion, the worst. But, uh, some things, yeah, you would have to, in not, yeah, some things are, yeah. But yeah, you know, it's, it's, you can, you have, 
family of things, but they will not be cyclists. Okay, they will be like more Good. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For uh, coordinating this joint American University of Georgia MOUAD uh, talk. Thank, Thank you. you.